enjoyed heavy metal. Heavy metal is a fantastic music. Heavy metal bass basically started back in the 60s and 70s with band Black Sabbath and very early on in my life I got started listening to Black Sabbath and bands like Deep Purple. It was albums especially by Black Sabbath, Paranoid, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath and later in the 80s when we, I started playing music I was very influenced by the more recent Sabbath albums like Mob Rules. Well, after I got involved in Black Sabbath, listening to Black Sabbath really heavily, I really, the interest in heavy metal grew and grew and grew. And Richie Blackmore, um, when he left the band Deep Purple, who I was listening to in the early 70s, formed a band called Rainbow with um, dynamic vocalist Ronnie James Dio. And I think that the problem with heavy metal right from the start is very obviously the satanic influence that's behind it. Satan has really used this music over the years and as you can see with Black Sabbath and Rainbow, you can really see the influence of the way Satan's used this music. And when I got into the early 80s, um, I got involved with listening to bands like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. And you can also see some evil lyrical content in those sort of bands as well, especially with Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast. That was a massive album in 1982. But um, again, I was you know, into the music, I was listening to it. I actually grew up in a Christian home and my parents were quite concerned, I guess, with me listening to heavy metal music, but I was kind of rebellious and I went away from my Christian faith for a while. So I just encourage you Christian guys out there that are watching this video to be wary of a lot of the things that you listen to because now there's a lot of great Christian music. But anyway, back to the music I was listening to. Um, it was in the, in the early 80s that the real evil music started to hit with bands like Venom and Celtic Frost and early Sodom albums. These are the albums that took the, the evil of Iron Maiden and, and Rainbow and Sabbath and all those sort of bands. It took them one step further and I started listening to um, bands like Venom and Celtic Frost, um, albums like Black Metal and things like that. And it really... I don't know, I really enjoyed the music, I really, really got into it, but it really took a hold of me. A really interesting thing happened in 1984. A friend introduced me to Resurrection Band, gave me the album Mummy Don't Love Daddy Anymore, which you're seeing on the screen right now. And that album had a big impact on my life. Actually, I, I just really called me back to my faith in the Lord, and I recommitted my life to the Lord at that stage through listening to Mummy Don't Love Daddy Anymore by Rez. Now, by no means was it anywhere near Venom or Iron Maiden or Judas Priest or any of these type of bands that I was listening to, but God really used it. It was hard rock, and I couldn't believe it. You know, hard rock, heavy metal music with Christian lyrics, it really, really blew me away. And it was basically from that album that I started going back to church and recommitted my life and made a very big step. I knew that music was was a big god in my life and i basically got out of it for a while and just more and more in, into christian music i also went out and started checking out other christian music that was happening at the time barnabas approaching light speed was out there and and the early barnabas albums and of course in 1984 the first striper album it came out yellow and black attack and that was really really amazing and i thought what these guys are doing, great, I could, I could do this. And basically around that time, I started playing bass guitar because I really felt like this is what I wanted to do. There was just something inside me that was telling me, hey, you know, get some music together and, and get out there in Australia especially, into the Australian heavy metal scene because I'd been a big part of the scene for a while. I'd gone and seen bands, Australian bands like Taramis and Bengal Tigers around that time were really opening up heavy metal music to the Australian market. And when, I remember the day that I really got the burning desire in my heart to play Christian heavy metal. I went into um, a thrash metal shop in Melbourne called Pipe Imported Records 
and they had all these black metal albums in there, the ones that I'd, you know, been into, Celtic Frost. And they had this new album by this band called Sodom. And it really, really fascinated me. It's just a three-piece band, really powerful. And the lyrics were obviously evil, like some of the other albums that I'd been listening to. And I walked out of that shop that day thinking, I can do something like this. I was seeing what Resurrection Band were doing, I was seeing what Striper and Barnes were doing, and I thought, I want to take it a bit step, a step further. I want to play heavy metal, maybe even bordering on a little bit of thrash. And um, I basically, as I said, I've really been interested in three-piece bands. We'll get onto that later on when you see with what I'm doing now um, about that interest in, the, in a three-piece band sound and performance. But um, at that time, I walked out of that shop and had a burning desire in my heart, and I believe it was a calling from the Lord to, to get out there and really witness for Christ in the heavy metal scene. Well, I got together with a few guys from a church that I was attending, and we basically just became a garage band, garage heavy metal band. There's even some punk influences even in there. And we just wrote our own songs, had a bit of fun. I had a very, very serious vision. I was, I've always been really dedicated to, really had a vision to get this thing really, really happening. Um, you know, I saw videos of Venom, I saw videos of Iron Maiden, I saw videos of Judas Priest, I thought, why can't a Christian band do that? I was just questioning myself every day. There's no reason why a Christian band can't do that. And when I went to the first Striper gig, that really confirmed that, that I saw, you know, like thousands of kids there listening to Christian heavy metal music, and I thought, yep, this is what I want to do, but the music has to be heaps heavier. That first band didn't really work out. In late 1986, I got together with three people, a, a female singer, Fader Hirschfield, a drummer, um, Rowan McDowell, and a guitarist, Chris Miller. And I thought of the name Light Force. We basically got together. Those guys weren't really into heavy metal or whatever, but I needed to make a start. That was important. And I always give some encouragement to you guys out there that are starting a band. Make a start. You know, get in the, into the garage. Start churning out some riffs. Get together with some other guys. Now, they may not be the guys that you end up actually playing with, but um, that's a good start. And we put, we put together a couple of demos, we did a couple of concerts, but it didn't really amount to anything more than that. The real light force came after that. That lineup actually basically totally split up very soon after. But it was a real starting ground. I needed to get into the studio, put together those demos, learn how to work with people. And they weren't really into what I was doing and I needed to be with people that were dedicated to, to my calling from God, I felt it was, and what I really, my vision to fulfill. And so it was in early 1987 that I got together with Cameron Hall and Errol Willenberg, Cameron being the guitarist that played on the Battle Zone album, Errol being the drummer that played on Battle Zone, and soon after, Steve Johnson joined the ranks, and basically you have what is the first official Light Force lineup. Well, 1987 was the real year that we really started doing things seriously. Around that time, what was happening in the Christian market was Baron Cross brought out an album just prior to that called Rock for the King and the first two Bloodgood albums came out and they were very, very influential on some of those early days. Steve Johnson, our singer, was especially into, into Bloodgood and Baron Cross and the rest of us were, I guess, generally as well. But the whole influence was around that classic heavy metal style and basically the Battle Zone album is in that style of classic heavy, heavy metal. Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Baron Cross, Bloodgood with a little bit of a thrash influence that I tried to put in there on the song Eyes of Destruction. And um, we had the classic heavy metal look. We had the studs, the leathers, um, all that sort of look that was really happening then with, with those sort of bands. Well, at this point, I might just diverse a bit and have a talk about why we play heavy metal music. Can Christianity and heavy metal music be mixed? I believe it can be very powerfully. And I'm going to read from my book, Metal Missionaries. Now, this is no longer available, unfortunately. But um, I just expound in this book exactly why Christian heavy metal is feasible, what it's doing, and I'm just going to read some parts of the book right now. Okay, chapter one is called Misconceptions, part one, metal music. Christians will often say that heavy metal music was created by the devil. This, if any Christian thinks about it, is a silly statement, because the devil is incapable of creating anything as such. He only perverts things. I guess you could say Satan created satanic worship or seances. However, these are not creations, they are only perversions. Satanic worship or activity in any form is only in existence to counteract the pure form of worship created by God, and that is how the angels in heaven worship God before the earth was created, and how we as Christians aim to worship today. We all agree that Satan didn't create sex. Sex is a very beautiful institution created by God for the pleasure of a married couple and also for them to be used for reproduction. However, Satan has perverted sexual activity, and we see a range of these perversions varying from fornication to more extreme perversions such as homosexuality or bestiality. 
Similarly, Satan has perverted God's creation of music, picked a style that suits his aggressive power and preaches his doctrines through many secular metal bands. Heavy metal music is not satanic. I repeat, heavy metal music is not satanic. It's the spirit behind it that makes it either good or evil. Heavy metal music with the spirit of God behind it can be used with equally as much power to express the power and authority of Jesus Christ. It can also be used in praise of God. Heavy metal music is in fact very scriptural. Psalms 150 reads, Praise him with lute and harp, could be transferred guitar. Praise him with timbrel and dance. Praise him with strings, which is guitar again, and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals, drums. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Heavy metal. It's all right, the Bible says it's okay. I'm sure that a lot of Christians have experienced an exhilaration and a meaning when people have been loudly clapping and praising God. There's something powerful about lifting your voice in praise. The very power of heavy metal brings exhilaration to the Christian bands that play it and is used to counteract the power of the devil, express the power of Jesus, to praise God's greatness and tell unsaved metal fans about salvation. It amazes me that many conservative Christians will say that Christian heavy metal is as much of the devil as secular metal when they go home and listen to their classical music collection. Many of the great classical composers that conservatives listen to were very perverted and satanically inspired people. In all music we can see the tarnishing of Satan's influences. He hasn't just picked on heavy metal, but also uses classical, opera and pop to preach his ways. Satan has used heavy metal in very blatantly to express evil, but the music itself is not evil, it's only a tool. Let me also take a look at long hair, that's a also been a controversial subject within the church. I've heard a lot of Christians say that the Bible says that men are not allowed to have long hair. I had to laugh last year when I was speaking on the phone to a Christian who said to me that one of the Ten Commandments was, man shall not have long hair. I thought he was joking but soon realised that he was serious. I don't know what Bible he was misinterpreting because he also said that it is of the devil to dance. I quickly pointed out to him the following Bible truths. Firstly, Psalms 150 says, praise him with timbrel and dance. And secondly, the Bible does not say that man cannot have long hair. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 14 states, Doth not nature itself teach that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? The Bible says, Do not commit adultery. Do not get drunk with wine. Do not kill. But in Corinthian times, it was a shame for a man to have long hair. It doesn't say that man cannot have long hair because it isn't pleasing to God. It was simply a shameful sign in those days. Long hair on men is not looked upon by God as being a sin because if it was, the Bible would say so. Long hair on men today is not even seen as being shameful but rather a way that some people care to look. The basic facts are that men in Jesus' day probably had long hair. Jesus did not wear a three-piece suit and drive around in a golden chariot. He probably would have had long hair, worn a plain cloak and I would imagine would have been often quite dirty from long walks along dusty trails. If you look at any portrait ever drawn of Jesus, he is almost always portrayed as having long hair. I realise that there is no description of Jesus in the Bible, but some truths about Jesus' appearance must have passed down through the ages for every painter in the last 2,000 years to have drawn Jesus with long hair. No Christian would argue that we need to aim to be like Jesus. Our dress and grooming should suit our God-given personalities and make us relatable to peers so that we can be all things to all men in order that we might be able to save some. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 22. In Old Testament times, long hair was a symbol of godliness. Men who took the Nazarite vow had long hair as a symbol of their godliness. Numbers 6, 1 to 5 states, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either a man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels, even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head, until the days be fulfilled in which he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. Thus we can see from the Bible itself that Paul's statement was meant in context for the people at Corinth because in another part of the Bible it was godly for men to have long hair. If you want to stick by your guns and insist that all we headbangers should be put to shame, don't forget Acts 5 verse 41 and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name.
We're going to have a look now at some footage from the Battle Zone days. I apologise for the fact that this is home video quality. A lot of what we will be showing on this video is home video quality, but just to give you guys an idea of what we were like, you know, what the live feel was like. So here we are, the Battle Zone days.
really proud that, that you would listen to the message that we're putting through our music and, and we hope it touches it. was recorded in August 1987 in an eight-track studio at a church called Truth and Liberation Concern. They have an in-house engineer producer, so we went down there for two weeks, basically spent a couple of weeks just in there, you know, grinding out the tunes and came up with the eight-song album, which is called Battlezone. Battlezone's a very interesting album. It went on to sell about a thousand copies within the end of 1987, 1988, was, which was quite good for an independent release. No record company or anything picked up on it. It was just an independent release, so we were really happy with that. Uh, it was well over a 1,000 copies actually sold within the first uh, 12 or 14 months. It was really interesting. It was a big learning time. It was the first serious project that we'd ever done. And um, as I said, we spent two weeks doing it, and we were quite happy with the responses. Um, the radio stations picked up on it and um, were quite impressed by it and it was really good. A lot of people were buying it from the Metal for Melbourne shop. So it not only sold really well in the Christian market, it also sold well on an international mail order basis and also in the secular shops as well. 1987 was a very, very interesting year for us. We actually in 1987 won the Melbourne Heavy Metal Battle of the Bands and it was a big point of um, big stepping stone for us from which we stepped. We went into a in competition with five secular bands there was a couple of glam bands that sang your typical glam sex stuff 
and a couple of um, heavy metal bands that did Iron Maiden covers and a few originals and a thrash band. And we came out and played our music and with, with Christian lyrics and won outrightly very, very easily with musicianship and, and, and performance and, and all that sort of thing. And we were just wrapped. I'll never forget walking up to um, the microphone that night and receiving our, our check for winning. It was like a, an amazing feel. There's like, you know, two, 250 local headbangers there all, you know, checking out the new talent. And it was just a great night. And it was, I think that was a night which, which started Alan Thomas's interest in us. Yeah, anyone who knows about Light Force will know that Alan Thomas um, was our manager for um, 18 months or two years back in those days. And he's a secular radio announcer. On three, he runs the Metal for Melbourne show on a 3 R in Melbourne. And um, it was then I think that he started becoming interested in the band. Right now we're going to cross to a bit of footage that um, Steve Johnson and I did an interview back in 1987. And it really, I think, shows um, where we were at at that time, the vision that we had, Steve and I had a serious vision and um, it's really interesting some of the things we said so we'll just cross now to some, and some interview footage from 1987. Hi, I'm Vic Campbell and I'm speaking with uh, Steve Johnson and Stephen Rowell from the band Light Force. Stephen, tell us something briefly about how Light Force formed. Well it formed, a, I had a vision for a, a Christian heavy metal band about three years ago after um, hearing this, the start of the Christian metal scene with Resurrection Band and Barnabas and bands like that. And it took uh, quite a few years, three and all, to actually get something that was a um, reasonable sounding band. I went through quite a few lineup changes and things. And then in the last year or so, I've got together with Steve, the singer, and, and um, Cameron and Errol, the other two in the band, and we've got something that's happening. And Steve, what sort of people do you see coming to your concerts? Um, a really wide variety of people come, Vic. It's uh, a lot of Christian kids support us. Um, we also, it depends basically what kind of a venue we play in. If we play in a, in a pub, it's, um, there's more non-Christian people there, people that are just off the street and, you know, come to pubs normally to see bands and, um, but we do have, we're steadily building up a a following of people that'll come and support us at our concerts no matter where we play and um, be there on hand to help us out you know it's really good and Light Force have had some success in uh, talent quests I believe that's right we we ended a talent quest here in, in Melbourne which was for heavy metal bands and we competed against a few of the secular bands here which we didn't know how we'd go because we were a Christian band we didn't know what sort of reaction we'd get that was actually our first concert that was that was outside the Christian organisation and we went down really well and we, we scored very well on presentation and, and, uh, and our music and we, we came out winners which has paved the way to, to a lot of the concerts in the secular venues such as Bell Street Rock which with the um, quite big Australian uh, heavy metal bands such as Taramis mm. and SAS and those sort of bands so we have for the amount of time we've been together done um, you know been accepted quite well and gone quite a fair way compared to um, most other metal bands that have been together a year. So Light Force has been fairly well accepted in the secular scene. What about from Christians? What sort of response do you find yourselves getting? Uh, well the church at, at first weren't really sure of what we were doing and there was a bit of a um, sort of a tension there we could tell. Not openly against us but we knew that they were a bit unsure. Um, our church, Harvest Christian Centre, is right behind our ministry. They support us wherever they can, in whatever way, with like discipling us to make sure we're right. And um, but I, every day, I suppose the it's the, the pressure's easing off, and people are realising that that there is fruit coming from our ministry, and people are getting reached. Um, so it's basically from the beginning when it was a bit bit tense and they, they weren't sure of us, now things are really opening up and God's really opening the doors up for us. There was an album, Battle Zone, recorded and released on cassette and I believe it's been very well received around Australia. Tell us something about the Battle Zone recording. Right, the, the Battle Zone um, album has been received quite well within the Christian scene and within the secular scene. I think we've sold about 300 in all, which is fairly good. Mm. And the, um, the heavy metal shop in the city has sold quite a number of copies and we sold um, over 40 in one concert last week in Sydney. Um, so yes, it's, it's being received quite well. Um, we're going to be reviewed in, in magazines in America 
and over in Germany very shortly, and we should be getting some mail orders, so we're looking forward to that. We're probably going to have to do a, a reissue of it. And yes, it's been generally accepted very well by the, the, the Christian scene and by the heavy metal scene, Every, wherever, wherever we're sending it and wherever it can be distributed to. Mm. So what does the future hold for Light Force? <laughs> well, basically, mm. we, we want to um, see if we can get a record deal somewhere. Um, we're not exactly sure where that is yet. We're getting distributed by David Smallbone. Um, our tape is Australia-wide at the moment. And hopefully we're going to look at getting on one of the Christian labels like Pure Metal Records or maybe Frontline Records. Or if the secular scene is open to it, maybe um, Metal Blade or one of the, the um, labels over in um, America or Germany. Australian metal is really taking off. Um, two uh, bands, one band from Melbourne, Taramis, a band from Sydney, Mortal Sin, are on very big labels overseas. So who knows, if we keep heading in the right direction, we may eventually be able to get on a label over there. Yeah. All right, mm. thanks guys, all the best. That was uh, Stephen Rowe, bass player from Light Force, and vocalist Steve Johnson. Wasn't it interesting to see that footage, to see Steve Johnson's hairstyle and my hairstyle pretty, pretty different, hey, compared to how they are now. Steve Johnson, mushroom head. Anyway, um, he'll kill me for saying that, but that's okay. Um, it's very interesting, a couple of the points that we made in that interview have come to pass. It's amazing um, the vision that God gave us Back in 1987, um, I remember getting the Messiah Prophet album, and especially the Saint album, on the newly formed Pure Metal Records. And it really impressed me, the concept of a Christian heavy metal label. I thought, this is great. This is obviously support for ministry, as well as, you know, because it's a Christian company, and getting their product out to the secular market. And as you can see on the interview with Steve and I that you just saw, um, we really focused upon the fact that we wanted to try and sign to either Pure Metal Records or Frontline. And it was really interesting, within the next year, we recorded our Mystical Thieves album, which was released by Pure Metal Records. We actually got signed to a contract with Pure Metal. And I also mentioned Frontline, and that's always kind of been like an ultimate vision. I mean, that's like the ultimate record label as far as Christian heavy metalists speaking. You know, they've got Vengeance, they've got Blood Good, they've got Sacred Warrior. They've got, you know, Shout, Recon, Tourniquet, all the big bands. And this is the great news that I've got for you people, you probably realise now by the time this video is out, is that my new band, the new form of Light Force, if you, I guess, Light Force, have, we've changed our name in a way. Um, and we're now Mortification, and we've just received word this week that we, our new album will be signed um, by Frontline Intense Records. But more about that later, but that's really exciting to see that that was our vision in 1987 and then all these things have come to pass.
Okay, 1988 brought this. I guess the classical Light Force lineup, the classical Light Force album, and what most people will remember Light Force for. As I said um, just a couple of minutes ago, um, we got signed to Pure Metal Records, and the result was this album, Mystical Thieves. The, and this was the album, album cover. Quite impressive album cover done by John Elphick. We thank John for his work, and um, he did a really great job on this. But 1988 was a very interesting year in a lot of ways. Um, nearly on early 1998, Cameron Hall was replaced by new guitarist Murray Adams, and we did our first major support slot um, supporting White Cross, which was a big thrill for us. And um, Mystical Thieves was just an amazing set of circumstances, the way that it all came about. We were actually going to go and record the second album in the same eight-track studio that we recorded Battlezone in, and we were rung up three days before to say that the studio was unavailable, and we were just devastated because we'd taken holidays, you know, we had everything prepared to release at night sort of thing. And so we thought, well, God must be doing something pretty special here. So Steve Johnson, our singer, made a few inquiries and we found out that Timbertop Studios was available and we could go in for a three-week period, which was the period over which we recorded the album. And we checked out the cost and it was phenomenal, you know, it was something like $8,000 and um, we didn't have the money and we didn't know what we were going to do. It was a 24-track professional studio, but we decided, hey, this could probably be worth the risk, if you like, because we will have a full-on studio quality album. And so it was amazing that um, after much prayer, we talked to Murray's parents and my parents and they agreed to loan us the money, which was fantastic. And we went in and recorded the Mystical Thieves album, which was a fantastic time. You know, we were in a professional 24-track studio for the first time. The album was produced and engineered by the same guy who produced Battlezone, um, John Boshua and the result was what you've heard with Mystical Thieves. Mystical Thieves is a very interesting album. We deliberately went for something of a style that no one's ever done before. Now we talked before about our influences from Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, Venom, Motorhead, and you can see a lot of those influences in the album. But the album is very unique in a lot of ways. The main way being that there's such a range of music on the album, everything from hard rock right through, the, through to thrash. Metal Missionary and Children of Sorrow and basically hard rock songs. Um, Mystical Thieves and Babylon, a classic Iron Maiden style, if you like, Man of War style, heavy metal songs. And of course, Searching in City Streets is a touching on your thrash. And I was so rapt to see all of those elements and that, that cross section uh, on the album. And it was exciting to see an album coming out that kind of touched a lot of different genres. Now, I don't think that I'd do that again, but it was interesting the way that it came out at that time. Yeah, the, the early albums, um, Mystical Thieves and, and Battlezone, evoked a lot of attention across the world and there was a lot of um, media interest. I've got on the front cover of, of um, German magazine Blood Sacrifice. Um, we've got in this, which is a, um, a French newsletter. We obviously got all our reviews done in Heaven's Metal. Heaven's Metal have been fantastic. I'd just like to really thank Doug Van Pelt for all his help with the band and there's review on Battlezone. Also, our Mystical Thieves album was reviewed in that. It was interesting, however, to see you know, album reviews in major heavy metal secular publications like Metal Hammer. It's got a, a Mystical Thieves review. Metal Forces, Mystical Thieves review. And I think one thing that really um, I was just so happy about, Hot Metal put out this magazine last year called The A to Z of Heavy Metal, Thrash and Hard Rock history of heavy metal and over 250 of the world's biggest bands. Now, where would you think that Light Force would be included in a magazine like this? We have a look in the section in here um, called The Oz. Now, it states down here, Melbourne has also been a hotbed of metal activity during the 80s. Traditional metal has been the domain of the Virgin Soldiers, Bengal Tigers, Taipan, Iron Drive, Crossmember, Fair Warning, SAS, Taramis and Light Force while well, Thrash and Death has been well handled by Nothing Sacred, Hobbs Angel of Death and Mass Confusion. It's interesting to see that we'd be included in a magazine like that and that was great and I guess we have had a big impact here, out here and praise God, you know, and I just really want to thank Alan Thomas for the time that he put into the band. Basically during the Mystical Thieves days, it was Alan Thomas that got us the gigs, he got us the tours, he, you know, organised the buses, 
um, got us on the big support dates with Mortal Sin and you know headlining the um, the metal you know Mardi Gras and things that were happening. And so I really thank you, Alan, for during the Mystical Thieves days especially and earlier, really helping the band. It was really great. I'm just going to take a look at here at some of the um, flyers. Let's take a look at these. Metal for Jesus. Um, this concert in Sydney was our first first trip into state, and um, that was in February 1988 with the Battle Zone lineup. In um, 1988, we also played at um, Jam 88 in another contest, and out of about 25 artists, arrived in the top five. Um, now they weren't all; we were the only metal artists, so that was with pop artists and everything. So we were really happy. That, you know, that year, or the year before, we'd won the secular heavy metal battle of the bands in 1988. We got top five in a Christian contest, so that was really great for the Christian market. In 1988, I said, 3rd of June, we supported White Cross, um, which was a really great time. And you can see here, in um, 1989, as we get into the into the Mystical Thieves tour, we started doing some real major tours, some major support. And you can see here, Van Leviticus from Sweden, and we got the support spot there in Melbourne and up in Sydney. And I guess the big highlight of um, 1989, besides our record launches, was our support of Striper. And um, you see here the fact that we know we've advertised that we've been part of the Striper concert. And um, here's Stripe advertised Yellow Black Attack tour. It wasn't actually the Yellow Black Attack album, it was actually In God We Trust tour, but this was a secular advertisement, so they thought it was better to call it Yellow Black tour. Um, special guest Light Force. That night we played um, to three and a half thousand people, and that was, that was great. As I said before, the first time that Stripe came out, I said, yeah, we can really do this. I, I can just see that, that you know, we need to do this, but in a, in a heavier way. And it was interesting that next time Stripe came out, we got the support slot, and it was great to play to that many people. We haven't got any um, live footage, unfortunately, but um, I just guarantee, you know, we, you'll see a couple of photos during this um, video compilation of us. You'll see the striper um, set in the background. We might actually show a couple of those right now. And um, you can see that yellow and black there, and there's us up there, and that was, that was a great time. As you can see here, we started headlining. Um, Alan set us up. Um, playing some of the biggest festivals across Australia. And here we have the Heavy Metal Holocaust, which went on in Brisbane, April 15th. Um, and um, here we are headlining Light Force. So it's great to headline some of the, the big um, heavy metal things that were put on. Now this is, this is a real, real highlight. This was something that was, was, really, was really great for us. Um, this is a secular magazine and you see the singles charts and the album charts and down here they have the heavy metal charts and um, for that month Mystical Thieves was number two on the um, Australian heavy metal charts. It's got Mystical Thieves pure metal and this is secularly speaking and it was really really great. Actually on the chart the very next month um, the album actually went down to number six. As I, I repeat this is a secular newspaper called Duke Magazine and here we are down here it says Melbourne band White Force take their beliefs into the metal charts so I mean it's amazing what God was doing and just opening up doors that we didn't even ask for and this sort of thing was was such a blessing to see this this happening to the band
Now this was a, a major, a major article that was um, put out by a magazine called People Magazine, and um, it's basically called it's called Death Metal City, and um, people were in the community were worried about death metal and, and satanic metal and the effect it was having on kids. Now let me state at this point that um, Ephesians 6 verse 10 states that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, we're wrestling against the devil, so in no way are we against people. I've actually spoken to Peter Hobbs, which is this guy here, we'll give you, have you a look at, give you a look at his album later on. He's the vocalist, lead vocalist and guitarist for Hobbs Angel of Death. Now Pete's a great guy, don't really get into his lyrics greatly, they're very satanic. It was interesting to see the fact that a big secular magazine put out a full colour, um, three page spread um, with Peter and Steve Johnson and myself just comparing um, what's going on in the death metal scene and also in the Christian scene. Actually, I actually might just read the article to you, it's very, very short. Melbourne is Australia's sinkhole of Satanism. The city's young fans are being led into devil worship by heavy metal bands with dire results. Christian heavy rockers have started a crusade against the devil and the death metal cult has taken a terrifying hold on young rock fans. The Satanism which surrounds the heavy metal scene came to a head when a young rock musician attacked a Melbourne church. A young 19 year old death metal musician broke into a Hawthorne church tearing up Bibles and painting satanic signs on church walls. He and another metal fan stole religious items including a cross and a priest's vestment and went on to rampage through the church painting 666 in red paint and throwing paint all over the floor, walls and curtains. According to Reverend Dawn Robbins, the church had to go through a re-hallowing after the ordeal. We weren't going to let the devil have the last word, she said. Mitten later committed suicide, yet police say there are no suspicious circumstances. No, no, I'm trying to interpret this because it's a bit twisted. So. Um, Mitten later died, he was the guy that um, did this stuff in the church, but police said there are no suspicious circumstances. But sad, as you see, such a guy doing such a thing, being in the metal, this is the reason that we do it. This is the reason that we're doing it, to get to kids like this. I mean, there's, so many, there's been so many deaths in the Australian heavy metal scene. A lead singer of one of Melbourne's biggest band died on a motorbike last year. I mean, this guy dies. You know, there's so many kids on drugs. Um, we just want to, even if the kids don't get saved, at least they have the opportunity through what Light Force has done and what mortification is going to be doing in the future, especially to the death metal scene, about hearing the gospel, at least they get the opportunity to hear it and they have the choice to either accept it or reject it. But I'll just go on with this. Alarmed at the spread of Satanism, Christian thrash metal band Light Force have started to fight the excesses of death metal. They are taking to the streets to play the same audiences as groups like Angel of Death, SIC, which means screaming in churches, and Nothing Sacred, whose lyrics are riddled with images of Satanism, death, and the occult. And although most death metal bands claim that Satanism is just a showbiz gimmick, the Christian rockers say a lot of young fans are taking it more seriously. I've had kids 15 or 16 come up to me at gigs and say they're into Satanism, says Light Force bassist Steve Rowe. I think he's extremely destructive, and that's true. One bloke I knew about four years ago used to sacrifice cats and cut himself by listening to this kind of music. He became obsessed with it. Steve says a drummer in another death metal band killed himself in his car while listening to American satanic rocker King Diamond. On the car stereo, he said, I know for a fact that King Diamond has fallen into Satanism. It's no gimmick. And that's true, guys like King Diamond, a couple of the guys in, um, in Venom, some of the other guys involved in the bigger heavy metal bands have admitted to seriously being involved in Satanism. And whether the Australian bands are serious about it or not, I know some of the young kids are taking it seriously. Singer Peter Hobbs of Melbourne band Angel of Death reckons that Christians should mind their own business. Well, one thing I'll just say about this article right now is that I spoke to Peter and the article kind of twisted both sides and made it, a, made it out to be a bit of a fight really, which it wasn't. It's interesting that you see here what they made us do. Peter's got a goat's head, a mounted goat's head and an upside down um, crucifix. And he's got his finger up giving the typical satanic sort of um, thing. And here's us, me and Steve Johnson with um, angels halos and a little white budgie. And me over here with my open Bible. Which was really interesting, it's just, it's a bit corny, the imagery, but it was interesting that they did it. After this, after this article actually came out, I spent 
a good deal of time one night talk, talking to Peter and what came out of the conversation was so interesting. Peter Hobbs, who now, he actually, oh, I'll show you his album later on, is actually now finished. They did their last concert last weekend. Um, he was on a major label and he's getting into his 30s and he kind of got a bit disillusioned with the whole metal scene and, and um, thought it was time to give it a call today. I don't know what the Christians get so upset about, Peter told People magazine. If they believe in God, there, all must, there must also be a devil. Do we all have to write carols? Anyway, I don't care anyway if they get upset. I'll do it anyway. Peter admits he has dabbled in the occult and even says he was once possessed by a demon. You've seen the, the film The Exorcist, Peter said. It was similar to that. But I don't go around killing cats or cutting goats' heads off. The RSPCA would have something to say about that. Although I admit it would make a good stage act. He says his songs like Satanic Overture, Satan's Crusade and House of Death are just a fantasy. Song lyrics like Lucifer Possessed My Soul are not meant to be taken seriously, he says. They're just like horror movies, he says. It's theatre. In, if that kind of stuff can be put into horror movies, why can't it be put into songs? According to Peter, his music can't be held responsible for the behaviour of death metal fans. If they're going to go out and blow their heads off, they're going to do it anyway. The music has nothing to do with it. If I kept playing Kill, Kill, Kill and someone went out and did it, you'd have to say that they were not all there to start with. Lead singer with Light for Steve Johnson says he has seen both sides of the heavy metal scene. He has tried his hand at the occult and he saw the light and found Jesus. Steve now works in conjunction with Dave and Rosanna Palmer at Church of the Rock in downtown St Kilda and works with street kids at a youth centre in the suburbs. I want to say something interesting about Dave and Rosanna at this stage. Um, Dave and Rosanna are part of Australian hard rock band Rosanna's Raiders and they had a big impact on um, getting our ministry off the ground, encouraging us. I mean, we were reaching out more to a metal scene, uh, thrash scene, they're more reaching out to a hard rock scene. But um, Steve's actually working now, Steve Johnson is actually working now with Dave and Rosanna at a church basically in the red light district of Melbourne and really reaching out to street people and stuff like that. So it's great to see him going on and doing that. Um, you would be amazed at the amount of young kids who are into the metal scene who come out, who come in and say they're involved in the occult. Things like Ouija boards and stuff. Steve said in America, death metal has such a hold on the fans that some are advertising their deaths in obituary columns and suiciding the same day. Steve Rose says, the cult has yet to reach that stage in Australia. A small minority of fans are taking the occultism and aggression of the music to extremes. I'd say that 90% of the thrash is just like the music and go to gigs to have a good time. That's true. It's just the other 10%. Um, but you must get some effect when people are constantly listening to songs which talk about ripping yourself apart. We once played a gig at a club that had all these satanic symbols painted all over the walls. We started singing about God and all these dudes started throwing beer at us, which was true. The musicians from Lightfoot say they would like to organise a double act with Hobbs Angel of Death. Well, it's interesting to see the effect of this sort of thing. Christian heavy metal, not versus satanic metal, but in there, you know, with the bands that are playing this music and seen the impact for Jesus. Rosanna's Raiders, as I mentioned before, have seen, you know, a dynamic impact for Jesus. They've seen, you know, numerous kids saved. We've seen, you know, a handful of kids saved. I think we're reaching out to a much tougher scene and um, I encourage anybody who's out there playing in heavy metal bands and maybe not seeing a great deal of people saved and maybe going on. That's our vision. But the Great Commission is to go out and, and tell the whole world about Jesus. And that's what we're doing, just basically going out and telling the whole world.
Along with the Mystical Thieves album, we also got on a compilation called The Axemen, which was with some of the biggest bands in the world, White Cross, Bride, Saint, um, Jerusalem, also Rosanna's Raiders were on there, which was great. We also got on um, the Metal Meltdown CD, which had, which had an interview with myself and a few other bands on Pure Metal. It was great to get on those releases. Um, we actually, one of the highlights of the time with the Mystical Thieves lineup was playing at Black Stump 89. Unfortunately, we haven't got any on video to, sh video to show you, but Black Stump 89 was probably the most memorable concert easily from um, the Mystical Thieves time. Just right now, we'll show you some photographs of the size and magnitude of that concert. We played to 6,000 people. It was a massive, you know, I don't know what it was, 150 cans, hydraulic light show, and it was really, really memorable night, and we actually got on the Black Stump album, which shows the Australian bands that played on that. And playing to 6,000 people, that was great. I got a vision, you know, to go overseas, play to that many people, play that many thrashers. Fantastic times, especially on the Mystical Thieves tour. I'll just relate a few stories to you. A couple of the hotels we stayed in were totally gnarly. We stayed in this hotel in Brisbane. It was on the main street of Brisbane, and the beds were like banana shaped, and there was no curtains on the window. And we had this great big gnarly street light out the front, and there was traffic going past at three o'clock in the morning. Oh, it was really, really unbelievable. Another hotel we stayed in in Sydney. Um, was had the whole of rooms and the beds were infested with cockroaches. These are the only hotels we could afford when we were on tour. And it was pretty scummy, but we had fun having cockroach fights. And um, it was quite cool. <laughs> we had fun on the road. It's really hard, you know, like touring and stuff like that. I mean, especially when, you, when you're touring from you know, Melbourne to Brisbane to Sydney, it takes days and days and hours and hours on the road and you have some really, really fun times. Okay, let's take a look at some footage now, just while I talk. Um, underneath the footage, we're going to have a look at some at the Mystical Thieves. We've got, got some footage shot at um, Sydney when we we're supporting White Cross, and some great footage of each individual member. Now we're going to have a look at Steve Johnson. What are some of the classic things about Steve Johnson? Obviously, his range of 20 different hairstyles over the time the, the Mystical Thieves album um, tour was happening. You know, one day it would be red, the next minute it'd be black, the next minute it would have a white streak down the side, one minute it'd be up, the next minute it would be down, the next minute he'd have a hat on. So Steve was really famous for his, um, his hairstyles and, um, and some of the outlandish clothes he got into, studs and striped pants. But he had a great voice, um, great singing voice. He was a great witness, he was a great front man and um, it was fantastic to work with Steve and thanks Steve for all your input. Now we'll take a look at Murray Adams. Now Murray was also a bit of a character. Uh, Murray was the type of guy that didn't care really what people thought about him. He looked pretty, um, what's the word? I won't say scummy, but he looked scummy sometimes. And uh, it was interesting that Murray was into, into folk music like Bruce Coburn. You can see him here with his Bruce Coburn t-shirt on and, and his um, Paisley shirt and um, 
But he was a great guitarist. Have a look at the, the ripping fingers of these lead styles. Murray just ripped. Anybody who saw Light Force in that time just marveled at Murray just ripping up and down the fretboard. He actually played in one song, you know, when, he, when we're having a really ripping gig, he actually played behind his head and he's just got so much talent. Thanks, Mars, for what you put in the band. Now have a look at Errol. Errol's famous for his incredible double kick drumming. You just see his double kick drumming now. He's a phenomenal drummer, a phenomenal heavy metal drummer. And Errol was known for his practical jokes on tour, pouring water down the back of my um, tracksuit pants while I was asleep at three o'clock in the morning in Brisbane at that hotel I was telling you about with the busted beds and the light outside. And it was the first time I got to sleep for four days and he poured water down my pants and I wasn't very impressed, but that's life on the road, I guess. And uh, thanks, Errol, for your input to the band. It was great. We enjoyed your, your practical jokes and your fun. And who's this funny-looking character? Oh, that's me. Um, well, we won't talk too much about me. You've been hearing me gas bag about what I'm all about all along on this video. And so we'll just have a look at this, um, this bass playing here, and that'll be about enough. You're all nearly bored. Yeah, OK, that'll do. When we played in Adelaide, we, we kind of got a bad response once, and there's all these punks there and when they found out we were a Christian band they started throwing beer at us and swearing at us. And... But that night we got to, to witness to them and witness to actually also Steve Johnson, our singer, witness to a high priestess Satanist. On a more fantastic note, one, one concert we did up in, in Brisbane, um, we went off stage and um, threw, there was about two or three hundred um, Brisbaneian metalheads there and they were chanting, God rules, God rules, God rules. Now it's, that's one of our songs. Um, but it was really interesting, that was the song that they were calling out for, but it was really interesting to hear this crowd of 300 secular metalheads chanting God rules. And it, was, it was great. And we had some great times on the road. And I really want to especially thank um, you know, the guys in, involved at that period of time. Steve Johnson, Errol, Murray and Alan Thomas and also Cameron for the great input that he's had in, in Light Force over the years. Nineteen eighty nine was a sad year in a lot of ways. We the kind of anyone who knows anything about the band would like to know what I'm about to say now. Why did Light Force finish? You know, why did the Mystical Thieves line up finish? It was basically that we kind of got disillusioned with um, the way that we were doing things musically. We couldn't agree on what we wanted to do musically. And um, basically the end of 1989, it was in God's will, definitely. Steve Johnson and Murray left the band. They just didn't feel the calling to it anymore. Murray wanted to go and reach out to street kids that were into skating and graffiti and stuff like that. Steve Johnson's actually gone on to record a pop single. He's recorded two songs. It's very impressive. And um, it's great that Steve's going to be reaching out in that area. And um, so basically overnight, or within the, you know, a month, um, Light Force first died. We had a disillusion with disillusionment with Pure Metal Records, you know, the, the contract did wasn't what we expected it to be and there were financial problems and stuff and um, at the start of 1990 it was just basically Errol and I left and Alan Thomas and I decided to split with Errol because, you know, um, we couldn't really, you know, get together on what we wanted to do. So then I was on my own and it was really funny, one minute you've got a band and you think, wow, God's fulfilling all my ministry and it's occasionally all of us are realise, I guess, that God will pull the carpet from under our feet and say, hey, okay, do you really trust me with your life? Do you really trust me with the calling that I put in your life? And it's pretty hard, pretty devastating when you've had this ministry and you've been so excited about it, and then all of a sudden, within a couple of months, you've got nothing. But God was taking me on to a new phase in the ministry. I said earlier on in the video, my real interest in three-piece bands. I don't know, there's been something about, about three-piece bands. All the time that I've been involved with listening to heavy metal music, you know, with Celtic Frost and, and Sodom and the early Motorhead and, um, you know, bands like Coroner and that. Three-piece bands really, really impressed me and I thought, well, maybe this is a chance to really do something that I want to do. And I prayed about it and the whole idea of a three-piece band with me playing bass and vocalising with the opportunity that really freaked me out. I was quite nervous about it. I thought, you know, have I got the ability to be a front man? Um, there's no use doing that unless I have. You know, I prayed about it and I really felt that, you know, I, I was going to go more more heavier than we did with um, with Mystical Thieves. 
And in the Christian market at that time and earlier, I was really getting into bands like Vengeance Rising, who had a human sacrifice and once dead our mouth. Really impressed by those, and I thought, this is the style of thing that I want to do here in Australia. And, um, I, you know, as I said before, bands like Sodom had um, really influenced me greatly. And so I went back to see Cameron Hall, who was on the Battles on Table. I said, listen, man, you know, the Mystical Thieves lineup's over. Um, this is my vision. I want to play sort of real doomy, um, really heavy, mixed with thrash music. I want to reach out to a more thrash scene. Will you be in on it? Are you interested in it? And he said, yeah, he really jumped in it. He knew um, drummer Jason, who at that time was in a band called Covenant, a Christian band that was sort of getting together. It weren't really happening for one reason or another. And um, the three of us got together and it was like, bang, within a couple of months, there was a three-piece band and I was really, really wrapped. I thought, wow, this is, this is what I've always had a vision for. It was like, I guess everybody will remember Light Force with the classical Mystical Thieves lineup. But we took the name into this three-piece lineup and um, in April 1990, we recorded the Break the Curse demo and really stepped out in what I see now as being the calling that God had on my life to reach out to this scene. I guess Mystical Thieves and Battles and everything I did before that was, was an apprenticeship to what's going to be launched from this point onwards. And it was fantastic around that time. Um, we, you know, we did, we did concerts, um, Break the Curse, has sold very, very well on the underground. It's another independent release similar to Battlezone. There have been, you know, like, um, you know, hundreds of copies, and it's been fantastic to see that going out there. And um, actually, I'll just say on camera, if anyone wants a copy of either Battlezone or Break the Curse, you can just simply send me $10 to P.O. Box 339, Mentone, Victoria, 3194, Australia. And just so you don't have to rewind your video, it's um, P.O. Box 339, Mentone, Victoria, 319 for Australia. So you can get hold of Break the Curse or Battle Zone from me in that way if you want to pick up a copy of those. And um, we'll just cut right now to um, some film footage from the Break the Curse demo launch in Harvest Christian Centre, Melbourne. And um, this was in June 1990 and it was a great motion time. <laughs> 